Action. Hello, guys. Welcome to our podcast, Pause for Effects. I'm Loxus. And, and I'm DT Foe. And today we're going to be discussing pretty much video games, new news. Um, it's going to be a pretty laid back podcast. This is podcast zero, um, episode zero, rather. So um, anything pretty much goes. So, DT, you got anything you want to discuss? Yeah, I think that, well, let me kick it off by first saying that, yeah, since this is episode zero, we are admittedly still trying to figure things out, trying to get to the rhythm, get to the battle, but you got to start somewhere and this is where we're starting. So going down the full list, going down the full docket, uh, you're up first, Loxus. Let the people know who you are, what you do, what you're about, what kind of person you are, your dark secrets inside. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm Loxus. Um, I'm a part-time streamer and a full-time IT specialist, you can say. Um, I mostly stream video games such as like fighting games like Smash, Street Fighter, um, Blaze Blue, um, Undernight. Other than that, I stream other games like Splatoon and classic games. Um, I'm a big lover of Mega Man, as you'll probably hear in a lot of these podcasts. I'm probably making a lot of references to Mega Man. Um, and yes, yeah, pretty much it for me. What about you, DT? Okay, so yes, I'm DT, also known as DT Foe, also known as DT Fox, because again, I can't really make much of a decision on the full name. But um, I'm primarily a cartoonist, a freelance cartoonist, freelance artist during most of my main time. Um, I currently have a day job elsewhere, and I'm trying to get into the art animation, some kind of industry where I could apply my artistic skills and abilities, hopefully one day. Um, but until then, it's mostly just online work, which is no problem at all. Um, but yeah, we've been wanting to start this podcast for a while, and we kept putting it off. But eventually, it's like... Again, you got to start somewhere. You got to get something started. So today is the day. Episode zero. Pause for effect. Took forever to figure out the name, but we got one name. <laughs> so, Man, it did take us a while to come up with his name, but we, yeah. we got it. We got it moving. We got it schmoving, as they say. You know what I'm saying? It's the kind so. of thing where, um, like, eventually, like you don't know what name you kind of want, and eventually, you just kind of come got to commit to something, and eventually, it'll become something of your own. Like all the other shows, Robot Chicken whatever other band names, Guns N' Roses, like, eventually it'll become your own identity. Speaking of which, um, how did you even come up with your name, per se? Which one? Oh, the... <laughs> the the one. Okay. Yeah, that's a funny explanation about that. So, um, for... Ever since I was... As far as I can remember, since I was a kid, like, I've always been called DT. That's just always been it. It's my first name, my middle name. We'll come to that secret one of these days, maybe add it to the lore or something. What kind um, of Pokemon? It's clearly like a, a fairy type, probably. But um, <laughs> yeah, so when I started taking up art, I needed a username. And I figured like, oh, a fox is my favorite animal, so I'll go with DC Fox. And that I stuck with that for a good while, and I still kind of do on the art side of things until I wanted to make a YouTube account back when YouTube accounts used to require usernames. So I tried to find DT Fox. It's like, I'm sorry, it was taken. And I'm like, what do you mean it was taken? Who took it? And it was some German kid who barely uploaded. So like, I had to figure out a different name. Like, all right, so DT Fox is not going to work. I need something else. How about, oh, real clever, F-A-U-X. And I could still say Fox, but it's spelled Faux. And so then I decided to go with that. But then that also started to confuse people because when people said, is it pronounced DT Fox or DT Faux? I had to give the full explanation. It was long-winded. It was obnoxious. And then they went like, you know what? I'll just call you DT. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably not the wrong for that. So um, now I just kind of commit to DT Foe as far as this username goes. But it's actually technically supposed to be DT Fox. So people who are listening to episode zero, you're kind of getting in on the secret at the moment. So basically That's your art pin name is Fox, but everything else is Foe. For the most part, yeah. Like, this is the foe is more or less the gamer tag slash social media tag. Like, it's the kind of handle that's less furry than the actual furry name would <laughs> technically be. Right. And it sounds cool, like, too. It, yeah, it does. It sounds French. Wee oui, wee, oui, je ne sais quoi, mon ami. You sound like a like an evil <laughs> version of yourself. Like, haha, I'm DT foe <laughs> curling my mustache. Um, I'm looking on this website right now, and um, I want to know did you see that cute little Sonic uh, team racing? animation that they made oh yeah i did see that and it was actually pretty well made um it's i feel like it's different from the sonic mania adventures thing but um it's still high quality in itself 
Yeah, I definitely noticed that um, with the art, it, they did a good job. They kind of did took the same approach that Arc Systems took with uh, Dragon Ball Fighters, where it's kind of like that 2D, but it's really 3D kind of thing. I thought, that, I thought that looked pretty cool. Um, did the same animators do that animation short? or I, I think uh, the character designer, at least Tyson Hesse, or Tyson Hess, however his name's pronounced, he did the character designs, but I think it was produced by a different team. But the funny thing about that is that it actually is 2D, it's just that the the cars are three D, but uh, when the cars are in motion, but it was, um, it was actually very a- interesting. Also, to mention that um, it looked like it's weird because it looked like Sonic and them are like classic because they kind of still went with that style, but it's like still modern Sonic. It was like really interesting seeing like Shadow and them in that style because it looks like that weird bridge between the two. You know what I'm saying? Like in that style, so it was really dope seeing them like yeah. that. It's definitely helped by the fact that, again, like the main artist, Tyson Hesse, he has such a love for Sonic and it seems in such a way. And like, he's such a skilled artist that um, when he first was doing like he, he more or less, it seems like he more or less got a job with Sega thanks to the fan of comics he made. But um, he also showed that like he cared so much about classic style Sonic, I think especially Sonic CD Sonic and giving it such a modern take that I think that's how they figured like a really nice middle ground. And um, I don't know, it just looks fantastic. And I kind of wish that Sega would continue this trend of like mixed media, I guess you would call it, or multimedia endeavor is what I would call it. Right. And yeah. I um, and I definitely, um, I don't know, I've always enjoyed the Sonic CD, I guess, era and style of Sonic. I think that was when he was at his peak. And that's when I felt like he was like the coolest. Like ever since I saw that intro in Sonic uh, Mega Collection, I think that's what it's called. Um, yeah. I, I just fell in love with Sonic CD. Instantly. I didn't care what the game did. It's just like that art style and even the movie that, you know, it followed up with that was just so amazing. Like Sonic's like his hair sticking up like he's like he's a shonen character or something. And he's like running and rainbows are popping up behind him. It's just like it's crazy. Dude's teleporting everywhere. The animation <laughs> was nice and flashy. Like that era is just really cool. And I'm glad that this particular artist and, you know, designer likes the same exact thing, you know, that I like with it. So it resonates with me um, a lot. But um, I was going to say, I was actually kind of on the fence when it came to Sonic Team Racing, because, you know, I'm a big advocate for Sonic Racing Transform, Sonic All-Star Racing Transform, and I really enjoyed that game a lot. And, it, you know, that game is very fluid. It's really fast. The transitions between all of the, uh, you know, all of the different um, racing formats, was really smooth aside from the water. That rap thing sucks. But um, but uh, other than that, I thought it was really neat. They put a lot of cool IPs in that some people probably never heard of. Um, it was really dope, and it felt fast, too. It felt like a Need for Speed game with, like, cartoon characters or something. And I'm, I was looking at the initial trailer for Sonic Team Racing, and it looks like it didn't really follow that format properly to me. But um, after looking at the, you know, more trailers, it looks really, really neat. And I like the fact it's a team-based game. They're smart for doing that because a lot of people like games where you can play with your homies against other people. You know what I'm saying? I feel like that'll definitely drag in a lot more people, especially with Crash Team Racing on the horizon. You know, it's going to have some competition for sure. But real quick on that, well, at least Crash Team Racing, um, I don't recall that ever really being real team racing. Like the original PlayStation 1 version that everyone loves, um, I don't recall it ever being team-based. I need to double-check yeah, that's what, so why is it called Crash Team Racing? I don't know. You know, actually, I noticed that there are other, like, I remember there being, like, a cartoon or something that was called Something Team Racing 2. Like, there's other games, I think, that had that same title, and I'm not exactly sure what that means. I'm not sure if that's some kind of play on words or something, or maybe that's just, like, some kind of general title. I don't know why it's called Crash Team Racing. Maybe in the actual storyline of the game, it's supposed to be, like, the good guys versus the bad guys. But, you know, we only play it for, you know, to play against each other. So maybe there is like a team thing going on there. I think there is legitimately a crash team racing, though, where you're where you are actually on teams with people, though. But yeah, I don't know why that's called why CTR is called CTR. It's weird. Yeah, I have, but yet at the same time, what was that one anime on Toonami that was that was re- actually team racing? They were all, if you do remember, it's it's started with an I and I think it was like GPX. But I can't Wait, remember the name. So familiar. You know oh, what? God. Screw it. I'm I don't. Look it up. 
Yeah, I was going to say. So while you're trying to look it up, yes, there was this one show on Toonami that it was like yep. a legitimate anime, but Toonami worked with like whichever studio in Japan to make it was. Oh, this an, I remember this. This anime was dope. Like this was uh, the first anime that I actually would accept that had freaking um, CGI in it because I hate I hate <laughs> anime with CGI in it. Um, but I think this may be one of those animes that be based off a video game potentially. Um, but yeah, it's basically then this anime they had it was like a mech anime where they raced in the mechs and they raced around city and did like parkour stuff and they battled. It was actually pretty dope. It was like Zoids but like racing. Like, it was pretty cool. I remember this. Um, it's Immortal Grand Prix, Prix or IGPX. That's right. what it was called. Yeah. So, man, that I, I'm getting nostalgic about that. I'm trying not to jump on too many tangents because we're on like the racing aspect right now. And that was true team racing. And yeah, like you're saying, it could be based off video game. It could probably be turned into a video game. And I honestly wouldn't be surprised if like maybe in another 10 years, someone goes like, you know what? I want to make a video game off of this because, you know, anything's possible. But I have a question for you. What's um, up? What do you think it would take for one of these um, racing games or different IP racing games to overtake Mario Kart? Because Mario uh, Kart has a big legacy. I'm going to let you, you know, give your answer in a second. Because I know Mario Kart has such a big legacy starting from Mario Kart on the Super Nintendo. And it's weird because Mario Kart is just like, that is a legit party game. Like, you get on that game just to piss your friends off. You know what I'm saying? Like, you get on there, you get your items. Everything's flashy. You get all your favorite Nintendo characters. But we've had other racing games. I like Sonic Riders. Most people don't because it's a niche in the game. But I um I like Sonic Riders. Um, you know what I'm saying? And there's like Sonic, you know, All-Star Race and Transform. There's Crash. But a lot of people look over those games for Mario Kart. Um, why do you think, what do you think it would, why do you think that's the case? And what do you think it would take to overcome that? Uh, what, Well, in my opinion, I don't think it'll ever be possible to overcome that unless like everyone just gets tired of Mario and Nintendo in general. Because it's the same situation as Smash Brothers where the character appeal is the most, is the biggest thing. And then the accessibility is the second biggest thing. Like, what is it? When you jump into Mario Kart, you kind of know what you're getting. You're getting at least split screen, up to 12 people online. You got Mario, you got Luigi, you got all the characters you love. You got the familiar items. You know what the items do. Like, you got the familiar worlds or locations. You got the Mushroom Kingdom. Like, you are you know what you're going to get. The competition, there is competitiveness there. But you're also ready for the shenanigans compared to so many other racing games where... It's still a high focus on skill, skill with little to items. But then when it comes to the items, there's not really as much. I don't want to say fun to it, but for example, Sega Sonic All Stars Racing Transform, they didn't really use a lot of Sega items as the weapons when you pick up items. There was random stuff. You got bees, you got tornadoes, you got some remote control car, which worked as like a red shell in a way. You got snowballs, but that didn't represent Sega and that didn't really represent Sonic. So it's as far as anything trying to dethrone Mario Kart, I don't think that's ever going to be possible until like the next Mario Kart is so terrible that people just go like, you know what? I want to move on to this next game. So I kind of like, see where you're oh, I'm going to cut you. I'm sorry. I'm gonna say, I kind of see where you're going with that. And this is that because um, I wanted to feed off of what you said there. So basically, um, they had that rung a bell in my head that Sega in these other racing games, like you said, like Mario Kart is iconic. Like you said, we know the stages. We know what a turtle shell is. We know how the star relates to the series. Everything kind of resonates with us. And it has a big history. Like you said, with Sonic um, All-Star Racing, they didn't have Transform. They didn't have any, they didn't have like a, maybe you could throw, you know, like a ring at somebody or something. Or maybe you could, throw, they got plenty of crap, you know, they could use. They could have had like the item things. It's like they had them as the capsules from, you know, the newer Sonic games. Maybe they could have used the retro capsules as your means of boxes, I guess, to get your items or something. And um, yeah. and I guess like the other thing with Sonic All-Star Race and Transform 2 is the fact that with it having so many different Sega IPs in it, I think it was harder for people to kind of really resonate with it because it's just like we don't know who half these people are. Like I never played, I know I've seen some of Amigo before, but I never played his game. So I don't have a familiarity with that character and they don't have a lot of Sonic characters in that game too, because it's a mixture. So I think that could be why in this new Sonic team racing game, you know, they're kind of focusing a bit more on Sonic. So maybe they'll actually be able to get that out. But like you said, um, 
with Sega having its rep as it does, and you know, I, unfortunately, I feel like because Sonic has become a meme of it having bad games and whatnot, I definitely feel like it's going to be harder to kind of push that game as hard as Mario is. You know what I'm saying? Because Mario Kart is like there, like it's so hard to overturn that game. Yeah, yeah. Lol. and um, uh, the trajectory is also the problem too. Is that it should have like Sonic and Sonic Team Racing or whichever should have been early on, while Sonic and Sega All Star should have came a little bit later. So the and I think that's why so many people weren't as excited for this game upon announcement. And like it's still kind of hard to get a pulse on how excited people are for Sega or Sonic Team Racing is because like it's not All Stars Racing Transformed. It's likely going to be a competent game. It's likely going to be a fun game and people are going to be playing it. But it's it's the kind of thing where it kind of feels like a step back. It's like going from Super Mario Galaxy to Super Mario 3D Land, where they're both still fun, good games. But it's it's hard to not it's hard to ignore that step backwards. Well, to be fair, I don't really know how you how are you going to top Mario? Ga- well, they did it in Odyssey somehow yeah but i was gonna say i don't know how you're gonna top that like i don't understand i i will keep saying this and i may say it every podcast potentially i don't know how they're going to top zelda breath of the wild i don't know how they're gonna do it they're gonna have to go back because i noticed with the switch one they technically did go back i don't know if this is technically the big the next big zelda game i think it's just like oh you're talking about link's awakening dx yeah that that is on the switch right it's not on the 3ds yeah Okay, it's going to yeah. be on the Switch, but it doesn't count as the next mainline Zelda. It, for all intents and purposes, it counts as a 2D top-down Zelda, but it's a remake of a Game Boy Game Boy Color game. So it's it's not it's not the game that comes after Breath of the Wild. It's it's kind of like in the same vein as A Link Between Worlds. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. So that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know how they're going to top Breath of the Wild. I hope we do get a new Zelda game. We're going to get a new Zelda game. But um, I do hope that we do get one. Um, and I'm definitely hoping that um, I guess it fits because I haven't played before Breath of the Wild. I never played a Zelda game in I don't know how long. I think the last Zelda game I played before that that I just really played through was Wind Waker, like 3D wise. And I remember playing Your Twilight Princess for a little bit, and that was interesting. Didn't play Skyward Sword, so it was like you know. And I didn't really, I wasn't really too into Ocarina of Time like that, like everybody else was, and Majora's Mask. So. Like, Breath of the Wild, I played all the way through and I beat it. That game was so good, and I feel like Nintendo did such a good job on that game as far as making it, um, you know, a game that can not only um, expand to, you know, that can, you know, that can only resonate with the, um, you know, traditional Zelda fans, but also people who may not have played a Zelda game before, you know? Like, there's a lot of friends I have that didn't like Zelda, and they got that game and enjoyed it. So it's pretty good. Yeah, and the funniest thing about that too is that well, two things to it is um the first one is that the Breath of the Wild feels like it kind of revisits Zelda one, where it just drops you into a world and you can go to any corner of the world as long as you can handle it. Um, so that's like a feeling that they were trying to get back, and it was a break from the other Zelda trends, which is like go to this first dungeon, get this item to the centric dungeon, then go to the next dungeon, so on and so forth. So um, opening up the world in that way did open up a lot for old school Zelda fans on top of new school Zelda fans or people who were never Zelda fans who will eventually become Zelda fans. The second thing is that um, fortunately, I believe Aonuma, who is in charge of producing the Zelda games, has already promised that Breath of the Wild formula is what they're going to continue on. Oh, it's hard to. What's it? Oh, no. Loxus, are you there? I didn't know that. Oh, sorry, your audio cut off for a second. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, but um, yeah, so he's already saying that that's the plan. Um, but again, it's hard to imagine how they're going to top it. But um, what I can already imagine is going to be probably either a new land or a transformed Hyrule. So it's not just the same thing all over again. But um, they're probably going to take some of the criticism from that game and maybe try to fix that up where... I'm trying to actually remember what one of the biggest criticism was. I think it was... Too many mini dungeons, not enough regular dungeons, possibly. Yeah, it was definitely because I watched a review on it shortly after I played it. Because I don't like, I've made it now um, where I watch reviews or typically look at reviews after I play the game than before. Because when you look at reviews before you play games, you know, it can alter your you know opinion on the game, whatever. But um, basically, I did see it, it was too many mini dungeons, not enough big dungeons. And the thing they were saying that the mini dungeons weren't challenging enough 
to um, sometimes to um, they felt like a lot of things were monotonous. Um, There's a lot of different things that people did. They didn't like those. Some people didn't like the weapon system. I feel like that's kind of subjective though. Cause it's like, I didn't mind it. You know what I'm saying? I thought it was pretty interesting because, you know, I have ADHD. So I like, you know, I'm changing from one thing to another anyway. So I like the idea that I won't have to just stick with this one weapon. I have the entire game. Cause I know it's like OD broken. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm glad that I can, you know, like, oh, no, I broke my axe and I have to go get another one. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just exciting. And you get so many new weapons and so many things interchange that I thought that was really interesting. Um, but, yeah, that's basically what yeah. I heard about it. I actually do agree with that, too, is that um, it keeps you on your toes. It is frustrating that, like, you're getting into a fight and then, like, the weapon that you really like shatters. Or you get an item so good that you're afraid it'll break so you never use it. But you wind up using weaker weapons, which kind of defeats the point. But, um I think that's kind of just all part of the general progress. But I think another issue with the game too, like you were mentioning was that it got, um, it wasn't challenging enough. And yeah, like once you get a certain amount of hearts, once you get a certain amount of stamina, once you beat some of the giant beasts, like it, it kind of trivializes a whole lot of stuff. Like Rivali's Gale gets you up mountains really quickly. The recharge is fast. When you get Mifa's Grace, Mifa's Grace is ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, all the flashbacks. <laughs> that um, you know, like you could lose all 20, 30 hearts you might have, and you get 30 more hearts back, so you could just keep fighting. Um And I think the biggest thing too is that um the bigger dungeons or the quote unquote main like I guess people's problem was that uh, now again now the mini dungeons, there was a lot of them and they were challenging. The big dungeons that actually mattered were too easy. That's what it was, and they were too easy. Cause it's just like, and it's the same repetitive thing. You go through, you go through the thing, you do the thing, you know, you go through the little gigantic map shaped like an animal, you get to the Ganon thing, you beat it. And then that's it. And it's like pretty, there was only one of them that gave me an issue. It was like a lightning one or something. That's the only one that gave me a big problem. But I mean, other than that, it was pretty, those things were pretty easy. Ganon himself was too easy. Like that was a, like this, the crap show of a boss. Like the, the, oh yeah, that was the other, yeah, of course, yeah, that was the fi- the big final criticism was that, like, the final, final boss was way too easy. Um, but part of me wonders is that, like, maybe they made it that easy so that people can, like, do their journey around. Um, and, like, maybe it could, it's, it is very subjective because I can understand, like, I want this game to be more challenging. But at the same time, it's like, look at this serene beauty just enjoy the ride, like enjoy the adventure, enjoy not having to worry about being killed for the next 10 minutes or so. Not only um, that, but you don't have to worry about, um, well, not only that, but you can technically make the game harder yourself. They give you the game. That game is made so that you can make the game however you want to make it. Like it's your adventure. So you could choose to be that guy to just run and fight Ganon with a stick in your hand. You know what I'm saying? Or like a level <laughs> one um, goblin sword or something. Or you cannot do the big dungeon. So you have to fight all of them before you fight Ganon. So you get your little boss gauntlet. So that's what I dig from Nintendo. So I think that whole argument, I think a lot of people argument of game difficulty is out of whack. Like, cause it's like, there's some games that are like, like hard, that are ridiculously hard for no reason. And it's stupid. And you got games that are designed well, you know, to make the game difficult or whatever. Like, I think that in Zelda's case, I think in that retrospect, that was good. What I don't agree with is that everything in the game can freaking kill you in two hits, no matter how many hearts you have. I think that's lame. Like, even though you have Mifa's grace, it's like, I can have 50 hearts. But if I fight this lion, though, he's going to take half of them junks in, like, one hit anyway. <laughs> yeah. Unless you well, have, like, until, five-star yeah. armor or something. Huh? Yeah, if you got that, like, guardian armor, then, like, you could pretty much... You could tank, like, ten hits, probably. Yeah, yeah, I had the guardian yeah. armor. And I also had that... Uh, I also, like, spiced my armor up to, like, five stars. I think they had, like, a star rating, ranking you could get them or something like that. But um, speaking of Nintendo games, I was going to transition over to this. So I want your honest opinion on this. All right. I hate it. <laughs> Thank you. And that wraps up the podcast. No, I'm joking. But um <laughs> all right. So Yoshi's Craft World. I played the demo for that game and I was bored shitless. Now, what? here's the thing. Here's the thing though. Here's the problem. The problem is that I played that game when I was really tired. I got home from work. Probably wasn't a good idea to play a game like that. That's not a game you play when you're like tired. Like that's like a chill. That game is too relaxing. 
Um, I guess because the last Yoshi game I played was like Yoshi's Island 2 or something. So I'm used to that Yoshi story, Yoshi Island-esque type of thing. And that game just wasn't hitting it for me. Even the whole having to re, you know, you have to keep going to the same stage and do this different thing. It just wasn't hitting for me. I don't know. Like, what do you, how do you feel about it? Um, I'm looking forward to it personally, and I think it's because like I wound up missing out on Yoshi's Epic Yarn, or at least I kept hoping it would come to Switch, that I skipped it on Wii U and 3DS. But um, Yoshi's Crafted World, um, I'm mixed on the visual representation a little bit, but as far as the gameplay, I'm kind of looking forward to it, only because like, it's going to be a solid game. It should be a fun game. It seems like it will be a generally chill game with enough hey man, of a challenge. what you got against Felt, man? I don't know. I guess I didn't have enough heartfelt situations in my life. Uh, Continue. I'm done. Aw. Oh, but, um, <laughs> yeah. So I don't really have any strong opinion one way or the other. I'm inevitably, I'm inevitably going to pick it up because it's a Nintendo game. It's a new Yoshi game. Um, it seems like it's one of the, going to be one of the better Yoshi games in the spectrum that like Yoshi oh, Island. Me? Cause like Yoshi Island is like the top tier of Yoshi games. Yoshi's story, depending on who you ask, either people loved it or hated it. Right, um, that's true. The other Yoshi Islands, Yoshi Island DS, um, you won't really hear a lot of people love it, and you will hear even less people who enjoyed Yoshi Island 3DS or New Super Yoshi Island, whatever it was called, but the music just sounded like a bunch of kindergartners just banging instruments oh together. Oh my goodness, that music <laughs> was so bad. Oh my god. Then it was on the, then it was on like a 3DS, speaker like oh that game yeah so like yoshi's woolly world seemed like the kind of turnaround where um p it was where people were starting to enjoy it a little bit more it didn't get as much traction because it was on the wii u unfortunately they tried to put it on the 3ds but you know it's a 3ds people have kind of moved on from that by now right, right um but uh overall though that's one that's considered one of the better yoshi games and yoshi's crafted world seems like it's going to continue the trend but in my opinion, the thing I find most egregious about it a little bit is that the felt Yoshi, it kind of feels a little bit unnecessary, even though it kind of fits the style. But felt Yoshi isn't as, is, isn't as cute as Wooly Yoshi. Because like Wooly Yoshi was pretty chibi style, where it kind of fit the whole made of cloth yarn kind of thing. Felt Yoshi is just a retextured Yoshi. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I don't know. I'm like, I don't like the approach they're taking with Yoshi, personally, myself. Like, I guess I'm kind of biased because Yoshi used to be my favorite character, you know, like Nintendo character when I was a kid. And Yoshi was cool, but I guess Yoshi didn't really have, like, a character back then, I guess. It was more like you're just a means of Mario riding on stuff, and you saved him as a kid. And he was pretty badass in that game because, you know, he's hauling a kid around and kicking ass and stuff like that. But it was just really, I guess it's like they started making his games a bit more kiddier, I guess. And he's more cute. And I guess that's not really what I wanted from Yoshi. So I guess I am a little biased on that one, I guess. Like, I don't know. I don't like this cute approach they're doing with Yoshi. They tried to pull that crap with Kirby, but, you know, they made that its own little thing. Kirby is cute anyway. So it's like, you don't really have to do much with him, but it's like, you want Yoshi to be like the next Kirby, just cute as hell. And his stuff is cute. But and like I said, that uh, that has his fan base. I mean, I'm sure it appeals to people. It's not my thing, though. But Yeah. yeah. But no, I, I don't blame you either. That Like, it seems like they're kind of stuck in like a storybook kind of style with Yoshi. Like, whereas Donkey Kong, he inhabits like a real world. Mario, for the most part, inhabits a real world unless it's Paper Mario, which is still like a living world in itself. Right. But for some reason with Yoshi, it seems to have to be either in a storybook or in a diorama or in a cardboard box, like Yoshi can't just live in his actual world like Yoshi Island kind of was when you think about it. Speaking even of though that, Yoshi. Oh, go ahead. Even yeah. though it had like, like Yoshi Island still had its own like kind of storybook coloring book style too. So maybe it's just hard for them to break that trend. But as you were saying. Oh, I was going to say that. Um, I forgot. But um, <laughs> I was going to say, uh, speaking of games on the new games on the Switch, though, did you get a chance to play Dragon's Mark for Death? I haven't yet, and I'd hate to say, but I think the a certain review on a certain site kind of maybe saved my money for a little while. But I'm hoping maybe what you're about to say might turn me around. All I got to say, 
It's that um, that's a little the reviews. They got pretty good reviews on the sites I went to, but I can see the downfall of it. All right, so the major downfall of the game to me is for one, you only have four characters. Now, ordinarily, that wouldn't be bad in a game. You know, that's pretty vast, like it is. Um, unfortunately, though, you have to pay. All right, so it goes like this: you can pay fifteen dollars and get two characters, right? So you pay fifteen dollars, fifteen ninety nine. Hmm. Sorry, I thought my computer was asleep. Oh, right, continue. <laughs> don't cut that either. Keep it there. No, but um, they got 50 <laughs> knuckles. All right. But anyways, um, it's $15 for um, you can either get the pack with the uh, I think it's like the warrior and you get the, the axe guy, the knight or whatever. And then for the second pack, which is $15, you get the mag- the mage and you get the shinobi or whatever, the ninja. Um, so total, if you want all four characters, which is the full experience of the game, then you're gonna have to pay thirty dollars. I don't know why you don't just pay thirty dollars anyway and just get that. Um, because I wanted to just get the um, I wanted to just get the ninja, but I ended up buying both games. I ended up paying thirty dollars or whatever. Anyways, the game is really awesome. Um, the plot's pretty cool. These is like whatever character you pick has a different type of storyline. You're just like this dude in you know, this dragon statue inhabits you. And like what's dope about the game is each character um, has different parts of their body that's taken over by this dragon spirit thing or whatever. So like my character, I have the Shinobi and his legs are like dragon legs. So he can do these cool flips and kicks in the air. He has like air dashes. Um, He has all these cool little acrobatic moves he can do. Um, you know, I was playing with Sonic Master, aka D. His character, he has the warrior or the Empress rather, and her dragon, her dragonoid is like on her arm. I like, guess yeah, they're called dragonoid. That's what it is. Their dragonoid is on her arm, so she can like shoot out fire blasts and there's like cool little stuff they can do. And you know, other characters have stuff in different places. Um, the gameplay, you know, it's made by NT Creates, the same people who made Mega Man Zero, um, and um, you know, Mighty Gunvolt, not Mighty Gunvolt, but Gunvolt, and also Mighty Gunvolt, um. I might and it plays, nine, but we're not going to talk about that. But um, I, I'm gonna go on that tangent at at a good time. But um, that um, the gameplay feels exactly like a Mega Man Zero or Mega Man ZX game with R with a typical MMO RPG format, which is really dope. Um, you get you know you get your level systems, you get your items, you can level your stuff up. Um, you get quest. You know, it's your typical like, you know, I'm in the hub area. You can pick whatever quest you want to do, type of thing. It kind of reminds me of like um, Final Fantasy Explorers, sort of, but like not quite as um, Monster Hunter-y, I guess. But it's like on a two D plane, and like the art's really good. I really like that game. And then you can play with up to four people with your friends. Like right online. now, me, Sonic Master, yeah, online, yeah, huh. me, Sonic Master, um, Super J, Don, we all play online right now consistently. Um, the max level right now is 60. Um, they have plenty of quests to do, and they also have alternate quests. The game is pretty damn hard, especially if you raise up the difficulty. Um, I think it's a really good game. Like, I really think you get aspect little spurts of like Mega Man inspired stuff between each character. Like, my character has the kick, the, you know, you can jump off the wall and he can dash, whereas, you know, D's character can shoot stuff kind of like a Mega Buster, you know what I'm saying? So it's like everybody got different different things on them so i think the game is pretty solid to me i think it's worth the 30 dollars. i just wish they should have just made the whole damn thing 30 dollars. i think but yeah i don't fully blame them for not making it 30 dollars because like if you can convince people to jump on board one of the two versions for 15 dollars, <laughs> and then they say hey i like this i want more then you got the other 15 but if they just say you know what this is enough for me then at least that you have their first 15 that's true. That's a good but, point. I think I'm just kind of salty because I was stupid and bought the first half that didn't have the ninja. So then I was forced to buy the second half. So now I have thirty dollars of a game, and I'm probably not. I may or may not use those other characters. Uh, but, but yeah, hmm. but it's all it's all good though. Okay. Um. So I mean, shoot. Now I actually do kind of want to get a little bit if it sounds that good. Um, it's pretty good. I'm not gonna lie. If you like Mega Man and you like if you like the Mega Man Zero S type of style and you like RPGs. And it's online. And you can play. You can play with random people too. It's really, really good. That game is really good and it's oh, really no. fun. I've streamed it a lot. Plugging my streaming, uh, but yeah, I streamed that game a lot. Um, I may play it tonight. You know, if everybody, well, no, because Sonic Man's not going to be around. But yeah, mm-hmm. and you can make different characters. So if you want to get on, I can make a new character and play with you. 
Um, it's pretty neat. Uh, I wasn't prepared to spend the 15 to possibly $30, but I might actually have to put that in my budget soon. Do it. Do it. <laughs> But um, but also seeing as like time is coming a little bit, um, I'll at least mention one game that I've been, I guess, kind of slightly into, but I don't want to say I love. But um, mm-hmm. have you heard of a puzzle game called Baba Is You? Somebody mentioned that game to me. Let me look that up. I want to see what it looks like. It looks and- it so. looks like a I wouldn't say generic, but like basic puzzle game that wouldn't really mean much to any random person but like when you actually see it in action and try to solve the puzzles it changes like everything and it's the kind it's like when it comes to puzzle games it's either like i'm either into it or i'm not like sure i'll play this more or i don't want to but baba is you is in that weird center where when i solve a puzzle i feel like a genius and when i don't i feel like the dumbest person in the world it's like that meme of like i'm a genius oh no kind of thing yeah. yeah i'm looking at the gameplay like this game looks pretty simple but like pretty fun it's not one of those games that look like you said looks like it's not much and then when you play it, you're like whoa this is the best game ever yeah so to explain how it goes um it's more or less like a it's a block puzzle word game or block word puzzle game where you play as this one bunny or sheep named baba and you have to comply with certain rules that are on the board so like say for example you need to reach a golden flag um, you got certain words that set the rules. So like one set of rules might be that Baba is you. Um, another rule is like flag is win. So if you touch the flag, you win. But another one, it might be like wall is stop. And another one might be rock is push. So you can push the rock if the rock is push, but <laughs> you can also change the rules. So say you move that word rock over to where Baba is you. If you move the rock in place of where Baba is, then rock is you. So now you're in control of the rock. Oh, that's dope. <laughs> that's pretty that's actually kind of sick, dude. How much is yeah. that game? Um, I wanna I think it's fifteen dollars. So it's not that not bad. bad. And there's a lot of content, but like it is the kind of game that will make you have to think like hard. And if you're not into that, this is not the game for you, and it may not be the game for me, but I'm trying. So Baba is for you though. Yeah, Baba is for him. Baba is him. So continuing, like, just some of the rules, at least. Like, say, for example, the flag is out of reach, but a rock is right there. If you can move the word flag is win and maybe change it to rock is win, then you just touch the rock after you move it to rock is win, and you win because the rock is win. Or you can't reach both of those, but maybe you can intersect Baba is you and Baba is win. If you get those in the right place, then you automatically win because Baba is win and Baba is you. So that's very, sick. I may very, actually get this game. <laughs> you're going to hate it. Like you're going to come back to me in like two days and say, you made a huge mistake or say, Damien, you should not have told me about this game, but that is 100% <laughs> probably, but it's, it's such a fantastic idea. Like the idea itself is worth the money. Even if you can't get past like stage five and that's very likely all things depending. Like I already had to look up, I think I'm like on 20 levels, but I already had to look up like, four solutions online and when you look up the solutions it seems so much more simpler because like it's a game that forces you to think even more outside the box than you think you already are thinking so like if you're on like the box outside the box you might need to think like three more boxes outside the box it's it's that ridiculous speaking of thinking outside the box and indie games you just rung a bell in my head about um hollow knight i tried to play that game i don't know once again it could have just been the time of the night you know what I'm saying? It was really late. Not to stop playing on. games. Tired. Yeah, yeah. It's just like I played that game, and I'm just like, I don't want to play this anymore. But see, I guess the thing is that I um, I never, I didn't grow up with like Metroid. I played a couple of Castlevania, so I'm not used to that quote unquote Metroidvania type of play style. I'm not really used to that per se. And I guess like it, it doesn't give you much direction either. So you're kind of just roaming around and that's probably the gimmick. But um, I guess maybe it could have been the time of the night I was playing. It was just like, I'm not really in the mood to do this. I kind of just want to just go from point A to point B, test my, my, my platforming skills. You know what I'm saying? But I looked at, you know, video reviews for it and I heard it picks up as you, you know, you get used to the game. You know what I'm saying? It picks up and it gets a lot better. So I just got to think of it when I'm playing it as if it's something like Breath of the Wild, where it's like an open world game where you start off small. You don't know what the hell you're doing. And then eventually things start making sense. So I just probably have to take some time to play it when I'm 
actively thinking you know what i'm saying so yeah and that's a tip i would definitely give like any kind of person that's into playing video games but is busy with their life is like if you kind of gauge how big the game might be and if it's bigger than what you can manage don't try to start just yet only because like one it'll hard it'll be hard for you to commit when you know you got like so many other things on your mind like um what did i pick up recently um i'm trying not to stay too long because i know we got stuff to do and stuff but um right right like uh shoot well i guess for example baba is you would be a good example is that i bought that game on a whim but i know that there's so many other games i want to play like i need i'm trying to practice on smash brothers for something i'm going to mention in a little bit um i still Mm -hmm. need to beat kingdom hearts but like conversely i recently picked up dmc5 and i play that all the way to the end and beat it but it's also kind of like the junk food kind of game where you could jump in and out, it's so active that like it's it's linear enough where you don't have to think too much about it. Aside from trying to land the sick combos, um, but if like you're getting into like big games like that, like I almost said Shovel Knight, Hollow Knight, um, any kind of RPG, Tales of Vesperia, I need to get back to Kingdom Hearts three. Like you got to be prepared to put in the time, and to play tired is definitely not a good idea at all. And that's a pretty good idea this, that you thought of as well for games we can even talk about in the next podcast. Like, oh, I have so wait, oh, he didn't beat it, so I can't really talk about Kingdom Hearts 3. Yeah, but, I mean, I can talk about what we think of it so far, you know, to where you are. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I wouldn't mind hearing, you know, your thoughts on Devil May Cry. And, um, you know, and maybe we can even talk about a Sekiro, you know, Devil May, you know, I mean, not Devil May, it's the, you know, Dark Souls featuring Shinobi guy. Um, yeah. We can talk about that hard ass game too. Um, in the next podcast. So you guys have a lot to look forward to in our next podcast, per se. Um, and like he said, we are kind of slightly coming up the time, but I was going to say that um, definitely, uh, what was I? I had, I had something on my mind, but I kind of forgot this now. Um, oh, we're going to talk about PAX. Oh, yeah. PAX, yeah, so... our boy here, the, the hero king himself, the guy who pushed through and made it through. Tell us about Tell us about your PAX trips. Tell yeah. about what we are to expect. So we'll so we can just, yeah pretty much jump to like the what's 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 planned kind of thing. I'll talk about my plan and the lead up to that, and then like we'll jump to your thing, and then we'll continue down the list because it's, it's almost time to go. But um, so um, any Smash fan, Nintendo fan, might have known that Nintendo ran the special event earlier this year of the online qualifiers. And they did three different types at three different times, Qualifier 1, Qualifier 2, Qualifier 3. You sign up on a website called BattleFi.com. You compete against other people. Unfortunately, the tournament did have items on, and it was single elimination, so it was partially skill. Very much luck, but at the end of the day, it's like how you utilize the the rules to your advantage. Um, So I took part in Online Qualifier 2. I'm well, let me start at the beginning. I miss online qualifier one because I thought I signed up. I didn't sign up. So that was kind of a done deal. I took part in online qualifier two and I made it all the way to the final round of qualifier two and got defeated by a really good Ness player. Um, so that was just kind of it. But then online qualifier three, I actually, (laughs) he's annoying in Smash Brothers Ultimate. Um, online qualifier three, I made it all the way to the end. I won my bracket. Because apparently there's like four brackets per region. So then I get to do... I want, I went on to the online final about a week later where the top four players of their region gets to play each other and the winner of that gets a free trip to PAX East. And the cool thing, at least with the online finals, is that it was streamed on Nintendo's Twitch site and YouTube. So people got a chance to see everyone perform. And the lead up to it was like the most harrowing thing ever because I'm just thinking like... All right, what's the plan? What's the strategy? What's the idea? Like, I even contacted Loxus here to see if I could get some daisy training in, and I dropped the ball in contacting him back. <laughs> Thanks for that, by the way. Yeah, my bad. But um, on the plus side, though, I pulled through. I, I do have to thank my brother because he is the one I ultimately did call to get some training time in with some characters that I wanted to play against in hopes to do good. So... In winning the online final number three, which was the last event too, I got a free trip up to PAX East, which is happening at the end of this week. And um, it's that was the main thing I really wanted to win. I can't go into too much of the details that Nintendo specifically says, like, hey, assume this is confidential, even if it's not. Like, assume anything we haven't announced is confidential. So 
when I get back, I could probably hopefully give more information in the next podcast episode. But um, as far as what's currently won, the free trip up to PAX East, um, free act entrance in the PAX East, so like the four-day pass um, from Thursday all the way to Sunday, getting to compete in Nintendo's official major tournament with 12 other people. And um, it's going to take place after like whatever Splatoon 2 tournament, which is also going to be cool to see. But uh, Ooh, yeah, it's going to be really good. Yeah. And the craziest thing, too, is that this is actually my third Nintendo event that I've ever actually won in my life. The first one was back in 2011 with Kid Icarus Uprising, where they were doing special events around um, certain regions of the U.S. Um, doing the multiplayer mode, whoever scored the most points got a free trip. I won that trip. And my brother got to come along. Thanks to him again, because he's the one who convinced me. Then the second time was 2014 with the Nintendo... With the Nintendo Super Smash Brothers for 3DS Open, where again at different regions they had different events. Um, it was for it was free for all items on. Whoever had the most KOs at the end of the time got to move on to the next round, and eventually I succeeded in like the north uh, northeast uh, Maryland region. So then I got another free trip up to New York. So now this is going to be the third time, but it's going to be a free trip up to Boston, and it's I'm hoping it's going to be a fun time. I've been trying to prepare ready to go. Um, if you guys don't see it on events.nintendo.com or Nintendo's Twitch or YouTube, um, I'll definitely try to like, see if I could link or reference in the description of wherever this next podcast is going to go up and um, wish me luck. I'm going to try to do my best. And that's kind of all at the moment. Yeah. I'm definitely going to um, definitely on my Twitter and even on my discord, I plan to plug you up like crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like as far as like, um, getting, you know, my people, you know, like my subscribers and stuff like involved and maybe cheering you on and stuff like that. So I appreciate the podcast. It. I mean, and they're going to, so- they're going to complain like, but it's, it's got items on. It doesn't count, man. Items, man. I mean, there's only a little bit of the community that's like actually super stupid tryhards like that, but, um, which is also really frustrating. That's something we can get into possibly in the next podcast as well. Um, definitely get into like, you know, the casual that'd be perfect especially after that tournament's over like the casual scene versus the competitive scene i guess and how it intertwines and things like that because we can go on a tangent about that literally for an hour yeah although the quick <laughs> um, two second tirade about that is that i do competitive stuff like loxus and i started competitively back all the way in town melee. city that won't be named at this episode <laughs> yeah, literally in melee like we literally entered i remember i entered my first tournament ever I was like, I think I was like 14. Had to, yeah. It was like right before, it was right before Smash, I mean, right before Brawl came out. So yeah. I had to have been like 14 or 13 or something when I went to that tournament. And I remember just how amazing that was. Um, I missed that feeling I had, that drive I had to even go. Because it was crazy how, I don't even know how the heck you even got me to go to that. I think it was just like, yo, they're having a tournament. You should come. And then I met your friend. Julian, I think was his name. What's his name? Uh, it was Nathan or Nathaniel. Nathan. Oh, ooh, I was way off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know your friend Larry, that guy. No, but um, <laughs> Julian, yeah, yeah. Nathan, Larry. I remember it was so funny because he talked trash literally from the time we got in the car to the tournament. After the tournament, on the way home, he was talking so much trash. I was so glad I beat him thanks to your little uh, strategy. You was like, "Yo, I, I remember that because I was using Fox." In the tournament, it's before I knew Fox was broken. Broke, but you was like, just do a figure eight. I'm like, figure eight, yeah, just literally run around the stage in like a figure eight format, and you win, and and it worked. And then after he found out, you gave me that advice. I remember he was so pissed. And then like a couple of days after that, he showed up to my house. I don't know how he remembered where I lived, but he showed up to my house. My mom was freaking out because you know Nathan was a lot older than us, yeah, and he was already married and stuff. Like he looked like a grown man. <laughs> coming over to a 13, 14-year-old's house saying, yo, where's CJ at? I'm trying to play some Smash. Her mom's like, uh, who is this guy? <laughs> you know, and that was pretty hilarious. And um, we ended up playing, and I, of course, I beat him there, too, because, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a beast. Why He's a G say? like that. But um, He still plays was, Melee, too. Good. He's a top fighter, that Loxus guy, so you should totally challenge him online. I do not play Melee. <laughs> no, I do, do not play. I didn't even use the Loxus tag back then, so you got to find CJ. That was still using CJ as my tag back then. <laughs> you got to find CJ. Yeah, I don't play Melee anymore. That would be awful. I can barely wave dash. I'm a, I'm an ultimate player or a Smash 4 player after Melee. Oh, a trash 4 player. Mm. No, I'm kidding. 
<laughs> but um, mm-mm, mm-mm. yeah, like I said, like we said, the Smash tirades will continue. Maybe in the next episode, we'll see how that goes. Um, because I know you got to get back to your thing. Yeah, like yeah. So like so um, what's what are you gonna be up to? Anything people can look forward to for you in the next week or two? Um. Mm. Um, I know that my year of being affiliate is coming up soon. Um, in April, on so Twitch. I may be doing a special, yeah, you know, on Twitch. Yep, man, I plan on. I may do like a special stream during that time. I'm not exactly sure what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna cook up something. Stop by my stream. Uh, you know, Losses underscore TV Twitch. You know, you know where to go. Um, you follow me over there. Um, you know, check out my streams. I'm right now. Currently, I'm playing um Battle Mega Man Battle Network. I'm gonna try and go through the whole series. Um, I beat one and two so far, and I'm on three, but I'm going back to one because that was years ago. So, you know, if you're interested in that game or just looking at retro games, you know, swing on by. Um, I'm also going to be uploading these podcasts onto my YouTube channel because I have nothing on there except for old Smash 4 videos. So um, for now, that will be the home for them. Maybe in the future, you know, we may decide to do something else. But, um, yeah, you just check out those two mediums. Um, Check out DT Folds. YouTube channel, my dude, he does Let's Plays. He needs to freaking stream himself drawing and yeah. get that free money. I can but. give uh, my side of things in. Um, as far as, uh, yeah, that I do do YouTube stuff, I need to get back more into it. But uh, if you go to DTFO slash, not slash, if you go to DTFO Gaming in the search bar, it'll show up. You might also see DTFO Classic where you could find older episodes involving me. You could find Foe and Friends episodes involving me and Loxus and some few other people. So there's a lot of content sitting there. I just need to make new content. Um uh, what else? Um, yeah, if you want to see what I might be up to, I'm most likely going to be giving general updates that I'm allowed to give while I'm at PAX East. Um, you can find me at uh, on Twitter at DTFO, D-T-F-A-U-X. Um, I'm still trying to get like everything else sorted out as far as other bits of social media. There is partial plan possibly to get this audio up on SoundCloud too, just as like a backup um site and who knows maybe if this thing takes off we could actually put it on stitcher and itunes but you actually got to apply it for that kind of stuff so who knows what kind of hurdles you got to jump through for that so yeah, man. Um, hurdles and turtles bro. Hurdles, yeah bro. pretty much turtles turtle turtle but uh so that's pretty much all for this podcast although Can you Ninja turtles? turtles count it off one, two, three, four. <laughs> turtles. They're like no other turtles. Watch out for Shredder. Turtles. Shredder. <laughs> We're DNA <teenage> brother. <laughs> but um, if we haven't scared you away with that just yet, and you have an email you want to send to us, uh, whether you just want to say hi, shout out, um, we w- won't really shill for you, unfortunately. So don't try to take that opportunity just yet. Um, but if you have any questions for us, for DTFO, for Lazy, that used to be the old username. <laughs> Um, yeah, Loxus. Yeah, Loxus. Loxus is what it is now. Loxus or DTFO. If you have any kind of questions, um, any kind of stories or anything like that, send an email over to pause4fx at gmail.com. That's P A U S, the number four, FX. In hindsight, this is actually a bad idea. <laughs> P A U S, four yeah. FX at gmail.com. And with any luck, we will be reading your emails in the next episode. So. I believe we've pretty much covered the full docket list paper that I typed up in like the course of 20 minutes. You have any last things to say, Loxus, before we get off this stupid thing? Actually, I have one word for you. Yeah. <laughs> Big bang attack. Wait, that's three words. Ah. <laughs> but, um, no, nah, but uh, that's pretty much it, man. I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Um, This is like I said, this is like a pilot run, so... It's no filter. We're not trying to be super professional. It's supposed to be nice and relaxed type of stream. Not well, not stream type of podcast. So I hope you guys enjoy it and look forward to the next one. The next episode, we'll probably be discussing uh, more on the newer games that's out and you know what we thought about it. So that's pretty much all for me. Yep. And uh, yeah, I don't really have much else to say. I'm gonna try not to get bodied at PAX this coming Saturday, Good and I'm uh, hopefully. Hopefully when I come back, I'll have like a trophy in hand or whatever the prize that they have yet to mention is going to be. So your yeah. prize is one free trip to GameStop. Yeah. <laughs> Two gold doubloons. Plastic. Plastic. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's it. Podcast is over. See you guys next time. Peace. Peace.